Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. We would like to get started with our K-State Garden Hour series. Thank you for joining us today. This series is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Krista Harding and I'm the horticulture agent in the South Wind Extension District. Um, before we get started today, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Um, first, we ask that you use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of the screen if you have questions related to this presentation. Um, we will look at those uh, questions that you have and um, we'll, we'll answer those at the end of this presentation. Our moderator is going to keep track of those. Our moderator today is Pam Paulson. She is the horticulture agent in Reno County and we appreciate her doing that. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will post it to our K-State Garden Hour website. Um, we typically upload some additional resources related to each topic as well, so you'll definitely want to check that out. You will also have access to the previously recorded topics and upcoming topics in the series on this website. Our moderator will send the link for this um, in the chat section. We recently added several events to this series. Some of the garden favorites include garlic in Kansas, tree planting, and spring flowering bulbs. We will continue a week-to-week -week schedule through the end of September, um, and then we will switch over and have one topic per month, October through December. The events in this series have been promoted on the K-State Horticulture and Natural Resources Facebook page. The moderator is going to share that link as well. You can stay up to date um, with the department as well as stay updated on upcoming topics in this series. Be sure to like, share, and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote this program. This webinar series has allowed us to continue to provide extension education related to horticulture and gardening, given the circumstances that we're in today. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we each have a love for gardening and the natural environment. So I'm excited about today's topic, getting the buzz on honeybees. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Raymond Cloyd. He is professor and state extension leader for entomology. He will discuss pollinator types, the biology and behavior of honeybees, and how a colony is structured, and we'll discuss some aspects of pollinator gardens. So Raymond, just a minute here, if you wanna share your screen and get started. What happened? You're good, Raymond. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, let me get my screen up. Can you, can you see everything now? There you go. You're good. Okay. Well, hello, everyone out there. Uh, this is your speaker. Obviously, this is not Kansas. This is in Italy when we paid a visit out there many, many years ago. Um, the title of today's presentation, and this is going to be a good one, Getting the Buzz on Honeybees. Um, obviously, many, many of you know me, I'm the extension entomologist at Kansas State, responsible for horticultural entomology and plant protection. So what can you expect in this uh, webinar? Well, I'm going to give you a brief introduction going to talk about pollinator types, then I'm going to focus in on one of the most important insects on the planet, honeybees, Apis mellifera, more specifically European honeybee, then talk about pollinator gardens 
And then hopefully there'll be some times for some inquisitive questions and discussion. So before I begin, I do want to talk about the other pollinators. There's a lot of different pollinators out there. Uh, honeybees, of course, are the primary one because they're the only insect that we've domesticated. But there's also bumblebees, native bees, also called solitary bees and wild bees, and also butterflies and moths. So when you look at the working insects on the prairie, also known as pollinators, it includes a diversity of bees and wasps, butterflies and moths, and even some beneficial insects. This is a really nice poster that you can obtain um, I believe from the KDA or other sources that provides information about the various types of pollinators that are out there in the environment. And really what's interesting is that there's sort of been a misperception or I would call many of these pollinators are not appreciated, but there's a really good book. Those of you sitting at home during this situation called The Forgotten Pollinators. Uh, Stephen Buckman and Gary Paul Nabian wrote it in 1996. It's actually right by my side here. I place it on my pillow each night and the information flows through osmosis into my brain cells. It's a really good book to read. Um, well designed, well thought out, good history of the pollinators that we don't really think about. So the bee pollinator types are twofold. They're the solitary bees. These are the wood and tunnel nesting solitary bees and ground nesting solitary bees. The other category is the social bees. This includes the infamous European honeybee and also bumblebees. Again, I want to say there are some other pollinators and one of the common ones is the leaf cutting bee, also called the alfalfa leaf cutting bee. This is the one that creates those crescent shaped uh, removal of uh, crescent shaped areas on leaves, mostly roses, and then they take that back and they provision their nest uh, with their offspring. But they are, again, uh, fairly efficient, fairly efficient pollinators. Another one we tend to uh, misconstrue or don't pay much attention to, although I think attention is gaining, is the Osmia group, also known as the orchard mason bees and the blue orchard bees. And if ever you see these wooden structures with holes in them, and you can make these very easily at home, these are where uh, orchard or mason bees and blue orchard bees nest. But and here on the upper left is a uh, photo of the blue orchard bee pollinating a flower. So you've seen these out there. These are some uh, chips or pieces of logs that you can cut, insert holes, or you can also buy we call these prefab setups, which have these poles or bamboo stakes that have holes in them. And again, that's where these osmia species, orchard mason bees or blue orchard bees are going to uh, reside and establish their nests. Well, you can also make your own. There's these really nice mason bee starter kits that are commercially available from Orkin, which provides a lot of good information on the biological controls that are out there. So I, I just want to emphasize that there are other pollinators out there uh, and they're very efficient um, other than the one that we're very familiar with, but also bumblebees. Bumblebees are very efficient pollinators, particularly in hoop houses and greenhouses for pollinating tomatoes because honeybees uh, don't like those types of environments. Uh, the bumblebee is native to the United States and is widely used and sold for use for pollinating tomatoes and hoop houses and greenhouses. Well, the one we're gonna focus in on is the most important without a doubt, and that is the European honeybee, also known as Apis mellifera. <clears throat> it is not native to the USA, but it is the most important pollinator of most of our agricultural crops, over about 130 crops at a value of 15 to $20 billion in the United States. It is the only insect that we have domesticated to perform functions to help us pollinate a wide diversity of crops. There's a lot of emphasis on honeybees and there should be. If you go to stores, you'll see for sale honey, you'll see bee outfits, you'll see jars for collecting honey, education materials. So there's a lot, you also see smokers, 
a lot of information, a lot of items that are out there for sale that are related to honeybees. Well, let's talk about the biology and the behavior of the honeybee. A honeybee colony may contain between 20 and 60,000 individuals. However, that number will vary depending on the availability of nectar and pollen. Of course, that's gonna be contingent on the availability of floral resources, primarily flowering plants, uh, the time of year and the health of the colony. When you look at the life cycle, there are an egg, five larval instars, a pupa and an adult. The honeybees feed in the floral nectar that is brought back to the hive by the foragers, which are actually sterilized females. The floral nectar is then stored in colonies as honey and bee bread. Honeybees can forage up to conservatively four miles from the hive. Now what they'll do, I'll come back to this, when they return, they, uh, when they get back to the hive, they will undergo either the round dance or the waggle dance, and I'll talk more in detail about those uh, in a few minutes. So let's get into some honeybee terminology that you may not be familiar with uh, that's pretty much put out there. Royal jelly. Royal jelly is a milky liquid consisting of pollen and honey that contains protein and lipids. The royal jelly is produced by the mandibular and hyperverdangial glands located in the head of young nurse bees. The royal jelly is used as a food source for worker bees and queen larvae. Now what happens when we talk about the cat brood is the royal jelly is the main food source for the larva in the first three days of development. But then afterward, the nurse bees that feed them will change. If they think that the, what they do is they go from a royal jelly. If it's gonna be a queen, they'll continue to feed them royal jelly. That will allow for or, or the ovarial development. Those that are gonna be sterilized uh, females or drones will be warded off royal jelly and provided with bee bread. Now bee bread is a mixture of pollen and diluted honey that is placed into the cells for storage and used to feed the larva after they have become established that they're gonna be either sterilized females or males also called drones. Honey is the substance produced from the floral nectar by reducing the water content. And what the bees do is they'll grab the floral nectar, they'll regurgitate it in and out of their mouth parts. And what they're doing is they're drying it out because honey has a water content less than 20% and a very high sugar content. And that's why honey can be stored for a very long period of time uh, because of that low water content. The last one is not known very well, and that's propolis. Propolis is a sticky plant-derived resin-like material used to line the inside of the honeybee hive. It's also referred to as bee glue. It's made from tree resins collected from leaf buds and tree sap and the worker bees collect the resins in their pollen baskets, which I show you a picture of or call a corbicula on their legs and it's then transported back to the hive. Okay, everybody get that? Let's move on. So the colony, the colony is the biological living unit consisting of tens of thousands of the workers, drones and a single queen. And then the hive is the structure where bees live and are maintained for those that are raising bees or associate beekeeping. So what's really important to understand is a honeybee colony is also referred to as a super organism. Uh, I, that's why I love working with the bees. They're so efficient. They don't worry about iPads or cell phones or the news or things like that. They have a job to do and they do it. But really a colony is a super organism. And bees exhibit what we call a social caste system. Uh, these are just examples of what happens inside. This is a demonstration of the honeybee hive, what's happening in there. And there are a series of caste systems or members associated with the honeybee colony. And the first one is the queen. There is only one queen and she lays all the eggs in the colony. Consequently, she's the mother of all the individuals. A queen can lay about 2,000 eggs per day and live for about two to four years. Now she's not laying eggs every day during that time period, 
but she can lay about 2,000 eggs during the advent of spring going into late summer. The workers are the sterilized females and they perform all the functions related to the colony, including caring for the brood, building the comb, tending the queen, those are referred to as nurse bees, and gathering resources, the foragers looking for pollen, nectar, and water. A colony may have between 20 to 60,000 workers. However, again, this depends on the age of the colony and the time of the year. The third member are the drones. These are male honeybees, and a colony may have up to a thousand of these drones. However, again, this is contingent on the honey, the colony vigor and health in the time of year. Now, what happens in the fall or following the end of honey flow, are the workers just remove the drones from the colony because once they've mated with the females, uh, their functionality declines in terms of helping the vigor and the health of the colony. So this is a nice poster <clears throat> that I have in my office where it talks about the queen. The life cycle from egg to adult for the queen is about 16 days, 21 for the workers, and about 24 for the drones. And this gives you an idea of what happens in what we call the cat brood. The cat brood is where the larva, pupa, and the eggs are. Uh, the eggs are laid and then you get larva and pupa. And this gives you what the diagram from egg laying all the way to and the emergence of the adults. And over here on the right, you see days in the worker bee tasks. And again, this is why insects are so efficient. They have a series of lists that they go through for each day that they're responsible for. So let's talk about the members from a morphological standpoint. The drone of the males, and you can tell the drones as the eyes are connected to each other right here. The queen has an abdomen that extends beyond the wings and the worker or sterilized females, uh, their eyes are not connected. So uh, drones are also for uh, to males using this diagram I obtained from a bee facility in Australia or and New Zealand. So the most important member of the colony is obviously the queen. There she is. You can see the extended abdomen going beyond the wing cover, and she's always going to be surrounded by a group of nurse bees. The nurse bees, of course, are tending her and protecting her, fanning her, making sure she stays cool so she doesn't overheat. Well, if you open a hive and you see a green dot on a bee, that's a queen. Not really. When we do research with bees, we always mark the queen on our thorax, the green dot indicating uh, it's, she's easier to find at that point. But this also shows the nurse bees around her, again, providing her with royal jelly, fanning her to keep her cool and tending to other items that uh, she needs at that time. So now let's move into what happens, and this is called the brood, uh, the honeycomb. The honeycomb is a mass of hexagonal wax cells built by the honeybees to contain larva and store honey and pollen. What you see here are the larva developing within each of these hexagonal wax cells. And these right here are the nurse bees and they're feeding the larva either with uh, royal jelly, if that larva is going to develop into queen, or they'll feed the larva with bee bread if it's going to develop into a sterilized worker, a uh, sterilized female worker, or a drone male. So if you take the larva out, which we've done here, you can see looks very different uh, from the adult. These are nurse bees, of course, uh, will be feeding the larva, again, either with royal jelly or bee bread, depending on uh, what member of the uh, colony that bee is going to become. Okay, so what we have here are, uh, this is the cat brood, I'll talk about that, but these are larvae and these are the nurse bees feeding them at this point. So this is a very, very active uh, colony or hive uh, and that's what you wanna see. So, so, late, so the cat brood is where we get eggs, larvae, and pupa. And so after a period of time of feeding, 
the nurse bees then seal that opening out and then the bee will continue to develop until she becomes or he becomes an adult and then chew their way out and then uh, get back and then they will then move into the, the colony and perform their functions. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the beehive, where the bees are located. But first of all, you need to put them in full sun. Uh, shade doesn't work very well. Also, you need to keep the weeds around the opening. This is where the bees are gonna go in and out. Uh, so it makes it easier for the bees, especially the foragers to go in and out after they've been looking for uh, floral resources or flowers for pollen and nectar. But what people don't also understand is you have to have a water source. Uh, this is a, a operation I work with where they have a stagnant water source and that's what bees like. Uh, and the bees will collect honey, bring it back to the hive and for a cooling, they use it for cooling the hive. Now a hive, the temperature should be between 93 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it gets hotter than that, then they need water and they fan the queen to keep those temperatures down because if they get too high, you, it can result in mortality. So in addition to the pollen and nectar, honeybees do require uh, food, a water source. So some people look at these and they wonder, well, what are these different structures? Well, the, the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, structures here are the brood chambers. That contains the queen and the nurse bees. But what these are, which are a little smaller, and they contain about 10 frames, these are supers, and that's where the honey's collected. Uh, you don't want your uh, bees in there, but that's where beekeepers collect their honey uh, during, during the season. So the brood chamber is associated with the queen and nurse bees, and the supers are uh, associated with the honey. Okay, so bees, again, why are the, they are the most important insects on the planet from a beneficial standpoint is their uh, contribution to pollinating plants. And uh, in California, between February and March, nearly all beekeepers send their hives out there to pollinate the almond orchards. If you've ever been out there, uh, that is my home state uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, if the area is just a buzz of bees. Uh, two hives per acre and a honeybee keeper can make between three hundred dollars to $900,000 in just a series of months. That's what most of the beekeepers make their money on is pollination services, not necessarily uh, production of honey. Then after that, they would collect their, uh, allow the bees to come back collect them and go back to a uh, flowering or floral resource for the remainder of the year. So here's a honeybee hive and this is what you'll see, the bees moving in and out. If you open out, these are the frames where I've showed you the uh, cat brood is located. So these are the bees coming out and that's why it's important to keep weeds and grass away so it doesn't inhibit them from going in and out of the hive. And these is, this is the hexagonal cells. The hexagon is a very good structure from an integrity standpoint uh, and maximizes the most efficient use of space. You can actually buy these uh, locally uh, and put them in your uh, hives or uh, in the supers. And this is where you'll get the production of honey and also cat brood. So here's an example of one of the beekeepers putting out one of the frames. And what we have in the upper left and the right, this is honey, the dark green gray color is honey. And you can see the honeybees are fairly active. Now what we're looking at is some honey down in the lower left, lower right, and this is now cat brew. This has taken some time probably between June and July, which is what you want to see. Lots of cat brood and also the production of honey, uh, which is of course going to be the food source. And honeybees need quite a bit of uh, honey in the wintertime to maintain their populations. So when a forager goes out looking for a floral resource, and that is related to flowering plants, 
there are two main food sources. There's pollen, which is the main source of protein, which of course uh, associate with amino acids. They're the fats, lipids, carbohydrates, certain enzymes that allow them to break down uh, components of honey from sucrose into glucose and fructose, minerals, sterols, micronutrients, and vitamins. The nectar, which is the main sugar source, is necessary for flight, uh, flight um, requirements, okay? So pollen and nectar are the main food sources for the honeybee. And of course, pollen is then used for uh, bee bread and uh, nectar is also used for the production of honey. So it's important to understand is that honeybees are polylactic. And what that means is they collect pollen nectar from a wide diverse array of flowering plants. Honeybees require a diversity of flowering plants or sources of pollen in order to obtain adequate amino acids. For example, dandelion is a good flowering plant. However, it doesn't provide sufficient quantities of amino acids to maintain a colony. So that's why bees have to feed on other flowering plants, whether it be uh, aster, goldenrod, lavender, rosemary, a wide assortment of plants that they can utilize to obtain an abundance of, of, of the amino acids and proteins uh, associated with the pollen. So here's an example of a honeybee feeding on the nectar of a lavender flower. Okay, so when a bee lands on a flower, and this, this, this is the mouth part, it's kind of a lapping, it goes in and out, they're feeding primarily on the nectar, and you know, bees have a lot of hairs on them, and that allows them to collect pollen, and then what they do is they brush it off, and they move it to the hind legs, and this is referred to the pollen basket, or the entomological term is the corbicula. And of course, they'll go back to the hive and then the nurse bees or other bees will then remove the pollen and start converting it into um, bee bread and other items we've already talked about. So here's an example of uh, honeybees doing their <laughs> pollination duties, responsibilities, going out there. This is probably a sage flower, which they, they really love overall. Um, so, uh, bees are on the decline slightly. The situation is not catastrophic or apocalyptic. The bees are doing quite well. But what's really important is we need to preserve them in some way. And so uh, before I get there, I want to talk about some anomalies people are, not, are not familiar with. And that's swarming. If anybody has seen a bee swarming, it's, it's an amazing event. And the reason they swarm is twofold. One is the quality of the hive has been reduced. And number two is it gets, gets too crowded. So one queen leaves and then a the numbers of drones and uh, sterilized females follow her and they get located in the trees or even on fire hydrants. And this is how some beekeepers uh, establish new, new colonies. The other thing you might see happening is that bees are bearding, we call it, outside the hive. And this is a response to the crowding that occurs. And they, they, keep, can't, they can't keep the colony down to the 93, 95 degree Fahrenheit level. So they just kind of come out and that's referred to as bearding. So I want to highlight some really, really good publications. They do make for some good bedtime reading if you're suffering from insomnia. Uh, they're really good. If you're an entomologist, they're just exciting as heck. But what I recommend is called the Nutritional Physiology and Ecology of Honeybees, a great publication from some of my colleagues uh, out there, um, Geraldine Wright, Susan Nicholson, Sharani Shafara. Uh, it's available online from the Annual Review of Entomology. Another good publication that came out of Purdue University Extension is called The Complex Life of the Honeybee. And again, I have this under my pillow each night and the material flows through my pillow into my brain cells and fills them up with wonderful knowledge. You can get it online at www.extension.purdue.edu. It's actually free uh, at this point. And then a really, really good book, I've read it three times now, is called The Beekeeper's Amen. 
how one man and half a billion honeybees help feed America. It's well written by Hannah Nordis. It's the story of John Miller. He's a beekeeper up in uh, the Dakotas, he has about 30,000 hives, uh, and just tells a lot of the background about bees, discusses some of the uh, maladies they'll talk about, and talks about the pollination aspects. So Christmas is not far away, and this would be a great Christmas present. Uh, I highly recommend. You'll learn a lot about bees after reading this book. So I want to talk about pollinator gardening, some of the misperceptions and things to uh, should be done to help our pollinators, not just honeybees, but wild bees, solitary bees and bumblebees and even butterflies and moths. So again, there's lots of resources out there. These are two of many books I have related to gardening plants for honeybees. But let's talk about some of the factors to consider when choosing plants for pollinator gardens. Number one, if you can use native bees, use plants with colorful flowers. Now remember, honeybees cannot perceive the color red or the wavelength, okay? People don't recognize that. Use plants that have fragrant flowers. Use those that flower for extended periods of time. You want flowers out there from about April all the way to October. Use plants that flower early in the season design mass plantings, and use plants that have landing pads. Uh, these are the chrysanthemum family, whether it be Compositae or Asteraceae. Remember, honeybees are active when the ambient air temperatures are over 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. When it's cooler than that, they're going to stay in the hives and they're not going to be active. So here's an example of honeybees on cucurbit flowers. And these are examples of the landing pads that honeybees can use to get on the flower and then get inside and uh, consume the nectar and then obtain pollen. There are lots of flowering plants that attract pollinators. Uh, one of my, two of my favorites are butterfly bush. And then the number one to me is Echinacea purpurea, which is purple cone flower. Uh, not only for Honeybees, bumblebees, and many butterflies and moths. Lavender and rosemary also are widely visited by honeybees, as well as wild onion, marigolds, uh, and aster. So this is a wild onion, and there's a plant in the KSU gardens that when it's blooming, you can probably find a hundred honeybees on that plant, as well as soldier beetles and some other uh, beneficial insects. This, without a doubt, in addition to at one of the aster species, is very, very attractive to honeybees. This is Caryopteris clandonensis dark night. This is in a nursery that we do research in Ottawa. This is Loma Vista nursery, and you cannot see it, but there were probably in this area between 200 and 300 honeybees visiting flowers. Uh, a very good plant to put in landscapes to provide a nectar and pollen source uh, for honeybees. So bumblebees also feed on clover and dandelion flowers. They're also a viable food source for uh, the native bees uh, that are out there. And here's an example. This is in operation on McDowell Road in Manhattan called the Plant Materials Institute, and they grow white and red clover as a pollinator source for the bees and other pollinators that are out there. Here's a pollinator conservation planting. You've got yarrow, you've got lavender, a uh, wide diversity of plants that are serving as a food source uh, for many types of bees. So here's another operation pollinator conservation planting area. In this case, it's probably got some Coreopsis or chrysanthemum plants in bloom uh, at this time of year. And then this is an operation I work with uh, east of Lors uh, Lewisburg. It's in Missouri, just across the border. And they have a conservation area uh, for pollinators, so several acres here. And this is just a picture we took uh, in the summertime showcasing uh, the, the wild Coreopsis and wild chrysanthemum related flowers that were in bloom. 
So it is important to incorporate plants in which the flowers attracted the pollinators, but in addition, it's also important to put in plants that bees can get the pollen and nectar. There are certain plants that have very deep corollas like fuchsia that they can't get out because of the deep corollas in there. And consequently, you want to find those plants that allow easy accessibility for bees to obtain the pollen and nectar. Okay, so what are some of the bee maladies? Well, there are lots of them. The varroa mite, without a doubt, is the number one destructive arthropod of honeybee colonies. It was established in 1987, and honeybee keepers have to treat for it. Otherwise, if they don't, uh, in September now or October, uh, they're going to see a decline in their, their colonies, especially the queens. The trachea mite was a major problem. However, due to resistance breeding, we have uh, resistance to trachea mite, which is good. American fowl brood, European fowl brood are two examples of bacteria that can be a problem for honeybee hives. Chot brood is a fungus and Nesema serrani and apius are two protozoa uh, that can cause some problems for honeybee hives. Wax moss and small high beetles are two insect pests that are a consequence of poor hygienic uh, maintaining of your hives. And so uh, they can be a problem. And then the really, to me, the number one malady is habitat fragmentation and destruction, the loss of pollinator habitats throughout the United States. So these are the major maladies that are out there and it's not just one of them, but it's probably a combination that are having an impact on honeybee hives uh, throughout the United States and also the world. So overall, let's be optimistic. Just be happy under these circumstances. So keep calm and love honeybees. What else is there overall? I uh, can't think of anything else more Wonderful and appealing as studying insects and really studying honeybees overall. It's, qu it's quite exciting from an entomological standpoint. Um, if you're going to walk the walk, talk the talk, or whatever, here I am with Keith Westervelt, of course, the owner of Louisville Nursery. And uh, I do not like staying in the office looking at screen all day. I want to get out, and here I am working with him. I'm taking off some of the supers, and we're looking at honey production and a pretty good supply of honey in this colony. So uh, again, working, I got my own bee outfit, working at the bees is, is very therapeutic. Okay, are you ready? Quiz, joke time. How do bees get to school? I'll give you a little bit of time to cogitate on that. What do you think? Well, let me take a swig of my Jack Daniels first. Good stuff. The answer is using the school bus. Yay, keep my day job. Now, I do want to highlight that the bees are wearing masks to keep the SARS-CoV-2, which is actually the correct name, from getting at them. So based on our current circumstances, I just want to highlight that. Well, I thank you for your attention. Hope you all learned something about bees. And with that, that's all I have. And again, I thank you for attending this. I hope you learned something about bees, have a greater appreciation with bees. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Raymond, thank you. Oh, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge on the topic today. Um, I learned some a few things too. Um, I know that we do have some questions to cover. We're going to begin our question and answer session, and we're going to try to answer as many of those as we can up until one o'clock. So our moderator, Pam Paulson, um, if you would want to start with the questions, we'll try to get those answered. Okay. Well, we've got a few questions on some plant recommendations for pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is a native shrub to attract pollinators, one that's maybe three to four feet high. 
Um, that that would be a question for the horticulturist, Pam. Uh, I'd actually had to go look myself for a, a native plant. Well, and I thought of a few, um, like some of the dwarf nine barks or the dwarf viburnums um, or service berry. The, the thing with some of those is they only bloom for a really short time. So. Yeah, that's the problem. And I'm not sure they provide a viable uh, amount of honey or excuse, pollen and nectar for the bees. Yeah. Um, okay. One person wants you to share your osmotic learning technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what you, you do is you, 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 you place your information uh, below your pillow. Uh, you put your pillow right over it, on top of it, center it, if you can. You lay your head sideways, facing north, and then you go to sleep, and the information fuses through the pillow. Now, you have to use a cotton pillow. You can't use a feather pillow. gets in through there, and it enters your head, and it's going to depend on the surface area, and fills your brain with the knowledge that's there. Okay, one of the other questions um, references purple coneflowers, how many per hive, but she's wanting to, or he's wanting to size a garden to support two hives. Oh, well, I would just say, uh, if you got two hives, just place about uh, two or three mass plantings of the purple coneflower, that should be enough. Okay. Um, and then how is the queen decided? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, when they're in the larval stage, it depends on the, uh, when, okay, remember, let me go back. For about three days, they feed, uh, the, the nurse bees feed the larva with royal jelly. We talked about that. As soon as they sent, and the, really what's the, it's the pheromones, the pheromones are given off or they sense that this is going to be a queen they'll feed them royal jelly only and then that will develop into the queen when they go to bee bread those are the ones that are going to be attuned to develop into drones and also uh sterilized females so it's more from a genetic basis uh once they know it's going to be a queen the queen gets nothing but royal jelly Okay. And this kind of ties into it. This next question is, how do the nurse bees know if the larva is a drone or a female worker bee and to know which food to feed it? Well, after three days, they'll, they'll sense uh, it'll be genetically or, or pheromones given off. But basically, it's based on genetics. They, they know, they know that these larvae are going to become either drones or sterilized females. And consequently, they stop feeding them royal jelly and they feed them bee bread. The other ones that they know are gonna be queens, they will continue feeding them royal jelly. Okay. And then we have a question on how many queens are born per the other worker bees? So the ratio of queen to, to worker bees, I guess. Well, there's really only one queen in a hive or colony. Okay. Now, now, let me, now, what can happen is this, is if the queen stops emitting certain pheromones, then some of the nurse bees will then start feeding a sterilized female royal jelly, and then she becomes the new queen, and the old queen is absconded out of the colony. Okay. And then we've got one on when bees are swarming honey, hummingbird feeders, is that good, bad, or nothing to worry about? Uh, it's really nothing to worry about because the bees are pretty docile. Um, if you have an issue with the blocking the hummingbirds, then you might want to call a beekeeper so they can take the bees and uh, put them into a, a hive. Okay. But really nothing to worry about. And then this one, um, probably references swarming. She says they were at a spring training baseball game in Arizona when a huge swarm gathered on the upper part of the backstop fence. Why did they gather there? Uh, they may have wanted to see the baseball game. I don't know. Uh, basically, <laughs> it's, it was probably just the location. I mean, why, why did those bees I show you in the image decide to swarm on a fire hydrant? Uh, it just ended up being a suitable location. They might have been tired of flying. And the queen might have been tired and she just needed a place to rest. 
and the rest of the swarmers came in along with her. Okay. And I'm just going to kind of add this on there on my own. We do get a lot of calls when bees start swarming and people are concerned about that swarm. Do they really need to do anything with it or just let it hap let happen what's going to happen with them? Well, really overall, I think let nature take its course. Uh, the bees are not going to attack anybody. Uh, like yellow jackets are very docile. If it is bothersome, you have children, then call a beekeeper or call the KDA to find a beekeeper that does go out and take care of swarms. Okay. And then this one is she came across bees in the ground. Could they be honeybees? Honeybees do not nest in the ground, um, but the solitary bees do, and some bumblebees do. Uh, yellow jackets will uh, make a nest in a road and burrow, but honeybees do, do not nest in the ground. Okay. Good question. And I think, um, there's one on suggestions for early blooming plants for pollinators. Um, some of the chrysanthemum group, Coreopsis, um, I think lavender is one, but again, I'd have to go back to my books and find out which ones are, when you say early blooming, I'm thinking you're talking April, May, Pam? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, what I find them the most on are my henbit and my my dandelions and my red bud trees early on. Yeah, yeah a really good flowering plant is the catnip uh, ground cover and sage, uh, purple sage. Those, we have them on campus here and uh, in the summertime and early spring, they can be uh, covered not just with honeybees, but also bumblebees. Yeah. A lot of those in the mint family are really good for attracting bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, salvia, sage would be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one, do honeybees compete with other bees? That's a really good question. And, you know, honeybees and bumblebees will uh, visit the same flower for nectar, nectar and pollen, basically. Uh, but there's a difference. And this is where evolution has come into play. Bumblebees are active when the ambient air temperatures are over 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're out earlier and later in the day than honeybees. So that will alleviate some of the competition. Uh, but there's been studies done mostly in Europe to show that there's some competition, but overall, because of the behavioral differences that show temperature, it's, it's not as big a factor as people think. Okay. And then another one, um, do honeybees swarm at specific times of the year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in general, Probably May through July is when we see most of the swarming. Okay. Um, and do honeybees sting? Now, the female, the sterilized workers can sting because they have ovipositors and they're the out there. The drones cannot because drones don't have an ovipositor. Uh, the females will sting but only on occasion. So, so the foraging workers or sterilized females, they can sting you. And what's really nasty about it is they have a barb stinger. So once you're stung, the bee dies because the barb stinger gets ripped out of their body. But what's really nasty is the venom pump keeps going and, st and continues to pump venom into your skin. And, and that's why some of these honeybee stings can be very irritating. And so people can have some um, aphylactic shock as a result of that. Now the bee queen, she has a sharpened ovipositor like yellow jackets. So she can multiple sting, unlike her uh, sterilized females that have the barb stingers. Okay. And I am not seeing any other questions, so. We may put out a last call for questions if anybody has some to type them real quick. Because we do have just a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. um, 
Here's one. What is the benefit of wasps? They see more wasps than bees um, in western part of Kansas. Uh, first of all, a wasp is a very general entomological term, also for hornets, things like that. But uh, let me narrow it down for the individual. If you're talking about bell-faced hornets, if you're talking about uh, yellow jackets, if you're talking about paper wasps or mud dabbers, they're actually sort of beneficial because they will attack caterpillars, unfortunately good and bad, and kill them and bring them back to their nest to provision it for their food for their offspring. So we actually classify wasps and hornets as predators because they will, they are carnivores, they will attack and kill other insects. Okay. And then how big of an area for planting flowers? For maintaining bees or? I think so. Well, as I indicated, you want mass plantings. Just don't put two, two echinacea in an area. You want to put like five to 10 in an area. So when you're trying to provide a pollinator source out there, put you know between 10 to 15 to 20 flowering plants. Uh, make it easy for them to find and provide an abundance of uh, floral resources. And I think it's important to find plants that bloom early all the way through the end of the season. You know, a lot of our perennials only bloom for a short time, so you want to mix a lot of different types that will bloom continuously, I guess. No, absolutely, Pam. That's what I said. You want plants blooming from April to probably in October, but that'll be a diversity of plants. And remember, it's good for honeybees because they're polyelectric to have different flowering types because one flower is probably, say for dandelion or echinacea, may not provide enough uh, amino acids related to protein to um, help them go through it and bring it back for the rest of the hive. So it's important to have probably five or six or more different flowering plants in a mass planting to provide an abundant floral resource for not only just honeybees, for also bumblebees and butterflies and moths. Okay, so what happens to the drones that get evicted from the hive? Uh, the drones that get evicted uh, die. They're either eaten by mice or rodents or they're attacked by wasps, yellow jackets, and other um, hymenoptera hornets that are out there. Yeah. Okay. And then what is the best time of day to check the beehives and is smoke needed all of the time? That's a really good question. It depends on temperature. We tend to go out in the early morning uh, when the bees are slower acting, more docile. Uh, we don't go out in the heat of the day because the bees are out there. They're, they can get all pissed off. Uh, they don't like it when you're doing that. So I, we tend to do it in the early morning hours, yeah. I found my bees are angry when it's been cloudy too and they haven't been able to get outside, so. Mm -hmm. I tend not to do it when they're, when it's not good weather, I guess. Um, what about yard treatments for mosquitoes? Uh, in terms of, are they negatively, will they negatively impact bees or? Yeah, or I, I suppose spraying around um, where, you, where you keep your hives maybe. Well, for number one, I do not recommend blanket spray applications for mosquitoes. You're gonna kill more beneficial insects, not just bees, but predators and parasitoids, and you're gonna kill mosquitoes. Um, uh, the way I like to deal with, deal with mosquitoes, and I talked about this Saturday at Blueville, is um, source reduction, remove all stagnant water, wear a repellent, DEET, and then also, if you have ponds, put in the mosquito dunks or flakes. Uh, they're only gonna kill mosquito larva. I am not a proponent and I do not recommend blanket applications for mosquitoes. You're going to kill um, a lot more beneficial insects than mosquitoes. Okay. And then how often should a hive be checked? Well, it depends how busy you are, but uh, hives should be checked at least uh, two or three times a week. Uh, if you have the time, once per day. Um, but at least two or three times per week. Okay. And, and the reason for that is you want to see, uh, check you have a queen, 
you want to make sure that you've got cat brood and you also make sure this time of year you've got honey which is going to provide the food source for the bees over the winter time and you also want to check for varroa mite uh, especially this time of year the varroa mite if it's not controlled um, it, it can cause decline of the colony very rapidly uh, during this time of year all the way to, all the way to winter so I would say check on frequently as possible, but no less than four to five times per week. Okay. And then you mentioned soldier beetles. Are they valuable as pollinators? That's a good question. Uh, soldier beetles, uh, we have the goldenrod soldier beetle out right now. Um, they're not efficient pollinators, but they're good predators. Uh, but no, they are not what I would consider a true pollinator like bees, um, that is honeybees and bumblebees and, and the solitary bees. Okay. And then um, this question is, they had a hotline call where an individual had very small yellow and black bees in her fern in the ground and she was stung seven times and it was somewhat painful. This was in Johnson County. Any suggestions on what type of bee that could have been? Do you know what time of year this occurred? It doesn't say. Okay, um, I would, I'm guessing, you know, you really don't like to do that. As many of you know, I like to see pictures and samples, but if it's this time of year, I would guess it's yellow jackets. Uh, we've had a number of instances where the Eastern yellow jacket, which is gonna reside in old burrows of uh, voles, rodents, um, things like that. Um, they're out and about, and they are very aggressive. They will actually attack you, unlike other um, of the Hymenopter, Wasp, and Hornets. And the other issue with Yellow Jackets is they have a very sharpened stinger, so they can multiple sting you. Uh, and that's another issue with Yellow Jackets. So, Pam, I'm only guessing at this time of year, it's probably going to be the Eastern Yellow Jacket that may be the issue. Okay. And then how do you treat for Varroa mite? <laughs> That's a good question. There's a lot of good information. Let me recommend the uh, Xerces Society. Xerces is X-E-R-C-E-S. They have a great website and a great guideline of treating for Varroa mite. But uh, there are three main miticides. There's Amitraz, Tafelvalinate, Cumafos. The problem is most of the Varroa mite populations have become resistant to all three of those. So we, right now, beekeepers are using uh, thiamol, oxalic acid, formic acid, and um, the, the hops material that are out there for Varroa mite. So if you get on the website and you find their really nice guide, it gives you a listing of the products commercially available for use on uh, Varroa mite. And right now is the time of year to start treating. You're starting, the, the clock is ticking. Okay. And then how much honey should you remove and still have enough honey left for the bees through the winter? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have to go back to my memory banks, but uh, Bees require between 40 to 60 pounds of honey. Um, let me be honest and say, I don't know, but they need quite a bit of honey to get through the winter time. And you have to assume the worst case scenario, it's a long winter uh, and you need to provide enough honey. But I can get back to you on the actual, there's a number or pounds of honey that uh, they're gonna need throughout the winter time. Okay, and then we've got one more question or time for probably one more question. Um, this one is, is it true that bees can become drunk and they will be kicked out of the hive? And she's heard that bees will allow this a couple of times, but eventually the bee will be permanently removed. Did you say the bees got drunk? Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard that. Uh, but it leads me to the point that um, I don't know what bees get drunk on, uh, not pollen and nectar, not water. But what's really interesting is that bees, they can detect 
a member that's sick from a fungus or bacteria and they will kick that member out. So that's why bees have great hygienic properties is they can detect when a sick individual is coming in, um, unlike the SARS-CoV-2 scenario, if there's a sick bee with a virus that comes in, they're booted out. Yeah. Especially if they're not wearing a mask. <laughs> Okay, well, and with that, it's one o'clock, so I think we'll probably wrap it up. And these are all really great questions. And Very thank you, Ray, yes. for some great information, too. You're welcome. Okay, once again, thank you for joining our Garden Hour series hosted by K State Reach Search and Extension. Um, this session will be recorded and posted by tomorrow afternoon on the website we give you earlier today. After the webinar ends, you should also receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at, to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. Thanks again. Well, bye everyone.